Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Ed Boland from uh, Books and Books. Uh, thank you for all the political junkies who are joining us this evening for uh, what's sure to be a wonderful conversation about an incredibly uh, timely book, um, Burning Down the House uh, by Julian Ziesler. Um, it's about Newt Gingrich, the fall of the speaker and the rise of the Republican Party. Now, um, Julian is a the Malcolm Forbes class of 1941 professor of history and public affairs at Princeton University. He's a CNN political analyst and a regular guest on NPR's Here and Now. He's also the award-winning author of over 20 books, um, which I'm not going to list them all because we'd be here too long. And he's published over a thousand op-eds and received fellowships from the Brookings Institution, the Guggenheim Foundation, the Russell Sage Foundation, the New York Historical Society, and he also co-hosts a popular podcast, Politics and Polls. So um, <clears throat> for such an expert, we had to bring in uh, someone equally um, as talented, and that's Samuel Friedman. He's an award-winning author, columnist, and professor. He's a former columnist for the New York Times and professor at Columbia University. Uh, he's the author of eight acclaimed books and is currently at work on his ninth, uh, which will be about Hubert Humphrey, civil rights, and the 1948 Democratic Convention. So, uh, Julian, Sam, uh, a virtual welcome to Books and Books. And don't forget, anyone, if you want, uh, you can purchase the book by clicking on the button under the conversation, uh, Burning on the House. That will take you right to the Books and Books website where you can pick up a copy of what I said, like I said, is an incredible, timely, uh, and interesting book. So if you have any political junkies that you know, it makes a great gift as well. So Julian, Samuel, welcome. Thanks. Great to be here, Ed. Thanks for having us. Nice to be here with you. Thanks uh, to the bookstore and thanks to both of you. And looking forward to the conversation, Sam. Yes, very much so. And uh, I just have to say to our web-based audience, if you don't know about books and books, this is one of the great bookstores in the whole country. And if you haven't been able to ever visit it uh, in physical space in South Florida, then this is a chance to get a great introduction to one of the splendid indie bookstores. Um, that's always a huge um, booster of authors like myself and Julian. So Julian, as a historian, your whole purpose in scholarly and journalistic life is to understand how the past talks to the present. And certainly there are going to be a lot of people following this conversation who uh, came of age as, as Newt Gingrich was coming of age and know a fair amount about him. But I also suspect there are a lot of people for whom Newt Gingrich is someone they associate with the contract with America, maybe, which is already back in 1994, or, you know, short-lived presidential race in 2016 or being... Uh, an advisor informally, albeit to Donald Trump now, but you're bringing us back to an earlier Gingrich and you're talking about a conflict between him and someone who I'm sure few people remember, Jim Wright, when he was the Speaker of the House. So what is this battle that Newt Gingrich and Jim Wright have all these years ago, decades ago, and why and how does it resonate for us today? Well, this is really a battle between two very different kinds of figures. Gingrich is someone who comes into the House of Representatives in 1979. He's the leader of a cohort of conservative Republicans who believe that Republicans have to let down the guardrails uh, in their partisan battles and do just about anything, be willing to go there uh, if they're ever going to reclaim power. Uh, Democrats controlled the House of Representatives since 1955, and Gingrich thought older Republicans were just too comfortable with the status quo. So he was willing to say anything about his opponents, uh, to use the kind of rhetoric which most leaders, even hardened partisans, thought was off limits, and to take every element of uh, politics and the political process and use it against his opponent. Uh, and that's who Gingrich is. He was known as a bit of a Joe McCarthy, a, a kind of toxic political bomb thrower who Republicans somewhat admired, but were also scared of. Jim Wright becomes Speaker of the House in 1987. He replaces Speaker Tip O'Neill. And he's an old school Texas Democrat. 
He believed in the old rules of politics. He believed in the art of legislating and governing. And he wasn't that uh, concerned about the post Watergate reforms that were opening up the system. He wasn't attuned to the new media of cable television and investigative journalism. So it's a real clash. And Gingrich attacks him saying, He's the most corrupt speaker in American history, and he launches a series of attacks based on stories about Jim Wright's ethics uh, and whether he broke ethics laws that the House had put into place. Right. In one of your chapters, you called Jim Wright the perfect foil, as in foe. In what way is he the perfect foil, and what does he do to put himself, you know, very specifically in Gingrich's uh, gun sights? Well, first, it's that, uh, you know, Gingrich's major argument that he uses to rise in power is not liberal versus conservative, but the Democrats are part of a corrupt establishment. It's a conservative populism that they are broken, they're tyrannical, they're autocratic, and they don't play by the rules. And this was his central message. And he told other Republicans, stay focused on this. Jim Wright was someone who uh, had stories about him in the press that raised questions about did he act uh, improperly or did he push the boundaries of what you're supposed to do? For example, he published a book of speeches and he would sell this in bulk to groups when he spoke to them. Didn't break the ethics rules, didn't break any law, but it looked bad. Uh, and these were the kinds of stories Gingrich seizes on uh, as a way to paint a bigger portrait. And Wright, secondly, is not attuned to the new fast paced world of the news media and isn't really comfortable or knowledgeable about how do you respond when being attacked front and center by someone like Gingrich. So in both ways, he was exactly the kind of leader Gingrich needed to move forward with his plan. There's a lot I want to drill down to in some subsequent questions, but for right now, how does this episode of Newt Gingrich successfully toppling the speaker um, inform the political world we're in today? What do we learn about politics in the Donald Trump era from looking back at Newt Gingrich tangling with Jim Wright in the late 1980s? Well, I argue that Newt Gingrich basically told fellow Republicans that the operating principle had to be partisanship above all else. Forget concerns about governing, forget concerns about the health of our democratic institutions, go all in on partisanship, a kind of smash mouth partisanship uh, that he promoted. And because he brings down the Speaker of the House, first time ever a speaker had to resign, this makes Gingrich not a Joe McCarthy, but a leader of the party. During the story I tell, he's elected to a leadership position, House Minority Whip. And when he brings down the Speaker of the House, for many Republicans who might not even have liked him personally, they say, well, his methods work. He just brought down the biggest player in Washington. And because of that, he's on the path to becoming speaker. And another part of my story is that many Republicans, including the civil types, start to embrace the rhetoric that he's using and the methods that he's using. And I argue that smash mouth partisanship, destructive partisanship, is exactly what we see right now every day uh, with the White House and with Republicans on Capitol Hill. You know, one thing I really appreciate in your portrait of Gingrich is the nuance of it, because on one hand, he is uh, the political figure who Gary Trudeau and Doonesbury used to represent just as this bomb floating in the air. In some of the Doonesbury strips, which a couple of them are reproduced, by the way, those of you who buy the book in the book. So he was this bomb thrower, but he also was an institution builder. And um, you bring back from the you know, mists of distant history, a group you formed called the Conservative Opportunity Society. And I wonder if you could tell people what that was and also whether we should think of this as a prototype of things like the Tea Party and the Freedom Caucus. For sure. So. One of the things Gingrich realizes when he comes to the House is that he is a lone voice to some extent in the party. Most of the senior Republicans, like Bob Michael, who was the House Minority Leader, they were still not really willing to do the kinds of things he thought were essential, uh, including using the media as an outlet to just 
go all out against Democrats. And so he forms this caucus. It's actually based on something called the uh, Democratic Study Group, which is a liberal group formed in the late 1950s to counteract the Southern Democrats who controlled the party. So he does this for conservatives and he gathers a group of Republicans like Robert Walker of Pennsylvania, Vin Weber of Minnesota, and a small group. And they're a very concentrated, uh, tight group. And they start to embark on all these ideas that Gingrich has about how to start going after uh, the Democrats. And so they coordinate their plan. They have really good communication. And it is a prototype for what the Tea Party will do when they come to Washington and they eventually form the Freedom Caucus. It's these small groups of like-minded uh, politicians who use informal groups like this to start to basically take over a party. You know, Gingrich also often portrays himself as a policy wonk, mm -hmm. as an intellectual of the movement. Is that a valid self-description or not? I don't think so. There, he does this effectively and, and he uses the fact he has a PhD in history from Tulane and worked for a few years as a professor in West Georgia College before going into politics. He's always used this as a way to package himself. And you ever hear Gingrich speak, he likes to give grandiose speeches filled with ideas. He's smart, he does have a lot of ideas, but I think he's really a partisan warrior in many ways. That's where his contributions are. Uh, the Conservative Opportunity Society is notable because of the tactics they used in the 1980s to go after Democrats rather than their ideas. So I think it's more, again, part of the way he's very effective in front of the media at presenting himself. Uh, and that big ideas vision or image masked a really a pretty tough, aggressive, mm -hmm. low form of politics. You know, I don't want to drag you into what's sometimes called by Michiko Kakutani, psychobiography, um, which she does not use approvingly. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in reading your book, the damaged family life that Newt Gingrich came out of is really palpable. And you can fill in some of that for our viewers. But I also wonder if you feel um, steady on your pins, speculating on how much coming out of that kind of repeatedly upheaved family life, and then actually causing upheavals in his own marital life as well, contributes to sort of this reservoir of anger that Gingrich is able to draw upon and very effectively channel. Yeah, I mean, it, it's always tough to get into the psychology of a, a leader, but I think both are probably relevant. He grows up under tough circumstances. His biological father leaves uh, only a few days after marrying his mom. And his stepfather, who does raise him, is very tough as a person, not very warm, not very loving. So I think he always has a fraught relationship in some ways with the person in charge. Uh, again, that's just psychoanalysis, but there's something uh, something to that. And secondly, growing up, he moved around a lot. This is a guy from outside of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, spends a lot of his teens as an army brat, moving around Europe, coming back to Georgia. So he never really belongs to a place. And that makes a little bit a sense that he's an outsider, that he's constantly going after his surroundings and establishment. He's not someone who feels much loyalty to any institution or place. The second part of your question is a whole other uh, kind of uh, issue, meaning he lived a life where his personal relationships were uh, very rocky, uh, at, to say the least. He uh, a notorious personal life that involved uh, several marriages, affairs, um, early in the 1980s that comes out in 1984 in a story of Mother Jones that's not only about Gingrich having affairs, but about serving divorce papers to his first wife while she's in the hospital uh, undergoing cancer surgery. Right. Uh, and, and this is uh, kind of a big discrepancy because this is a guy who's part of a coalition with the religious right and the moral majority. But what's interesting is none of this bothers him. There's a certain form of shamelessness that's mm -hmm. the essence of what allows Gingrich to move forward almost like a weapon, uh, even when these stories come out about him. Right. No, like a weapon is a very appropriate phrase. 
And along those lines, you know, although he's still a very junior member of the House when he dares to try to bring down um, Jim Wright, he does a test drive before that. And that involves a congressman, well, also like Wright, a Democrat named Charles Diggs. What, what was the battle with Charles Diggs about? And what was his purpose in pursuing it? It's interesting. So even, so he runs in 74, runs in 76. Gingrich loses both times to the incumbent, uh, an old school Democrat uh, named Jack Flint. And finally, open seat in 78. He wins and he comes in office. And his first target is Charlie Diggs, who's one of the founders of the Congressional Black Caucus, very prominent figure in the civil rights community. He was under investigation for taking kickbacks. Uh, from his congressional staff. And usually the process during an investigation is the party of the member, in this case, the Democrats, decides whether anything is warranted, whether just to wait until the investigation is over and then decide if any kind of punishment is necessary or to take punitive steps. But Gingrich doesn't care about any of that. And <laughs> right away, he starts attacking and he starts to say that the House shouldn't allow Charlie Diggs to speak, to vote, to have any role in the process until the investigation is complete. And Democrats are really angry about this. They say it's not appropriate, uh, nor is it normal for a, a first year member to be going after a senior member like this. But the story plays very well into his narrative about corruption on Capitol Hill. Uh, interestingly, some staffers and Republicans privately are, are warning him this isn't the best person to go after for a Southern conservative, to go after a prominent African-American. But Gingrich doesn't care. He says it has nothing to do with race. He'll go after white politicians, African-American politicians. But this is his first target. Um, and it really puts him in the national press. Well, you know, just as a side point, the fact that he uh, was born in Pennsylvania, as you said, moved around as an army brat and goes to the Atlanta area at the time when the Sun Belt is becoming a place with a lot more geographical mobility, corporate transferees moving in and out, gave him this ability to represent the South and in some ways to draw upon, you know, the wedge issue of race there without being held accountable for it the way someone who had come up through the Southern political system might have. I mean, you even note that he even managed to get endorsed by the African-American newspaper in Atlanta in his first race. He does. I mean, he's uh, he, he'll often mention that even today when attacked about his use of white backlash politics. He'll say, I had those endorsements, although he doesn't get endorsed in his final race where he wins because the newspaper says he was just lying in his campaign <laughs> and not telling the truth about his opponent. Right. Um, but, you know, he is part of a generation earlier than where we are today, uh, where when race is used and white backlash politics is part of the story, it's not said. It, it's through code words. It's through right. focusing on particular policies. I think he's of that era. Mm -hmm. So reading this book and being a journalist as well as an author and a journalism professor is kind of a humbling experience in several ways. and. Maybe some of this also goes under the category of, um, you know, the unexpected outcomes of best intentions. Yeah. But you talk and write very incisively about the role that investigative journalists play in the Jim Wright um, struggle and about the role C-SPAN plays. And both of these were seen by I think most liberals and moderates, I can't speak as authoritatively for conservatives, as good things. Good to have a camera without you know, deceptive edits or anything else, just recording what's going on in Congress so citizens can see it on their cable TV. Good to have journalists who in the post Woodward and Bernstein era don't genuflect to politicians in power and will question and examine and probe. But both of those seeming goods, C-SPAN and investigative reporting, were successfully weaponized by Gingrich. So how did that happen? 
And how much responsibility does the fourth estate have for the direction our politics has taken? It's a big part of my story. It really didn't start that way. And it came out of the research and it was pretty remarkable. You can take investigative journalism and you had this generation of post Watergate journalists who were really focused on the money and politics beat and, and doing good work at the national and local level about the different kinds of relationships that existed between members and lobbyists and fundraisers and donors. Um, but you know, these are often bits and pieces stories. They might tell a little bit as they did of Jim Wright uh, and that he had a business relationship with a real estate developer in Fort Worth. This was a story covered extensively and they invested in oil properties and oil investments. And these investigative reporters put this in the papers. There was nothing illegal about what was done and it was legitimate in that moment of politics but in the hands of someone like Gingrich, he could take a story like that and then go to the press and say, look, it's evidence that he is a totally criminal and corrupt uh, form of politician. And again and again, what I saw were these stories which were half cooked in some ways uh, and they didn't necessarily lead to that conclusion were used by Gingrich's generation as a very powerful weapon to whip Washington up into a scandal frenzy. I, I have one story in the book that really captured it for me, where a young journalist not related to the speaker, Robert Wright, uh, who covers science, he's still a very good journalist, but he joined the New Republic uh, right before Jim Wright becomes speaker, and he's brought on, and the person who's supposed to write a story about Jim Wright is, I can't remember, he was sick or gone, so they asked Robert Wright to take the story about Jim Wright becoming speaker. And Wright uh, puts out a pretty tough piece about Jim Wright, saying uh, he might not be the voice for the post-Watergate Democrats. He's kind of old school and maybe a little shady. Um, and it's a big deal, because this is a moment the New Republic has some weight in Washington, and this was a big statement from a liberal magazine. But Wright didn't know that much about politics, and he admitted so much later. And he didn't understand if the stories about the new speaker were really different than what other members of Congress mm -hmm. did. How did this fit in the history? But Gingrich seizes on an article like this and will distribute it, saying, look, the New Republic agrees to what I, I did. So I think they really became part of, uh, they are weaponized very quickly, even if their intentions were good. Well, also, they're very willing to make use of the mainstream media that they revile most of the time. Once a critical story is in the New Republic or the Washington Post or the New York Times, they point to it the rest of the time. They assail exactly those sorts of news organizations. And then just to pick up the other thread from my earlier question, what does Gingrich do with C-SPAN? So C-SPAN is, is one of his favorite platforms. And the, the story in my book that captures it best is in 1984, uh, he goes on this channel. Uh, well, he, he makes speeches at the end of every day in Congress, he and his allies. And they're called one minute speeches. They take place at the end of the day when everyone's left, uh, either to fundraisers, dinners, or back to their offices. And they take to the floor every day and they make these blistering speeches about Democrats being weak on defense, unpatriotic, not supporting Ronald Reagan's war in Central America. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they are doing it because C-SPAN now covers these speeches, which a decade earlier, no one would have seen. And they get more and more aggressive in their words and they start to attack individual Democrats and, and ask them to respond. So they'll say, Congressman X, you don't support our national security, and how do you respond to this? And if you're watching C-SPAN, the Democrats have no response. But you couldn't see that the chamber was totally empty, <laughs> political theater. And the whole thing blows up uh, when Speaker O'Neill is so mad, Speaker Tip O'Neill, he asked the cameras to pan the chamber and show this is all a ruse, there's nothing there. But Gingrich is instinctively a, a responder. So as soon as Tip O'Neill does this, he says, look, the speaker is violating the rules. The camera should only point to the speaker. And he's corrupt, just like I keep saying. Mm -hmm. And they continue with their speeches over the next few days. And finally, 
Gingrich and his group, they start talking about Congressman Eddie Boland of Massachusetts. And, um, and this is a ver someone very close to O'Neill. Now, O'Neill gets so mad, he comes to the floor and he makes this really uh, you know, famous uh, and, and pretty tough speech saying what Gingrich and his group were doing, there was the lowest thing in his career in politics that he had ever seen. And the Republicans turn that on Tip O'Neill. They say his comments should be struck from the record. This is mm -hmm. not what a speaker should be saying. But the end of this whole thing is really what Gingrich wanted. The national news covers this story. All three networks cover what they call cam scam, and they have national stories about Gingrich, about the Conservative Opportunity Society, about their attacks on Democrats as weak on defense, and that was the game plan. As right. Gingrich said, if you give the media confrontation and conflict, they will absorb it, and C-SPAN was a perfect way to get this out there. One last quick question, because then I wanna make sure we have time for some questions from Ed Boland from Books and Books, and then um, open it up to audience questions. But just to jump way ahead, um, there's a Shakespearean trajectory yeah. to Gingrich. I don't want to say he's a hero, but he has that, or maybe the Greek one about hubris. Um, he loses his speakership. How does that happen? So uh, he becomes speaker after the 1994 midterm elections when Republicans take control of Congress as Gingrich promised. He finally delivers and he became Speaker of the House. And a few years later, the Republican House is moving to impeach President Bill Clinton in 1998 for uh, perjury over an affair that he had with an intern, Monica Lewinsky. Uh, and, and this is culminating in November and December of 1998. And two things happen. First, the midterms go poorly for Republicans and Republicans thought the president's being impeached, they should be the ones doing well. And so they're angry with Gingrich, who's their speaker. And they don't really want him, they, they think he's taking them down a bad path. And the second part is he is having an affair at the time that this is all unfolding. And they understand this is problematic if it would come out uh, in the press, uh, that he is doing exactly what's at the heart of, of the impeachment. So in I guess a Shakespearean uh, kind of style, he ultimately, he, he loses his job in 1998 and is brought down. Uh, it's fitting too though, in that he brought down the first speaker and, and created an environment where everyone can be brought down very quickly. So if you have scorched earth uh, and then you're on top, you're likely uh, to have a very similar outcome. Right, I have to wonder what Jim Wright thought about seeing Gingrich uh, well, uh, actually, I, there's a, actually one of the things I have at the end of the book is I found these letters. When Gingrich becomes speaker, uh, uh, Jim Wright writes this very heartfelt letter to him, very long, saying that he doesn't, he can't forget what Gingrich did to him, and he'll never forgive him for basically criminalizing his, he says that, criminalizing his reputation when he didn't do anything wrong. But he says, I will forgive you. And he writes, I hope your speakership goes well. Uh, and I wish you the best. And, and it was amazing because Gingrich doesn't respond for many months. Mm -hmm. And then he finally writes a letter and it's about two words, like, thanks for the note. Good luck with oh. it, kind of note, which captures the difference between the two of them. But then Wright was interviewed as Gingrich fell from power and, and Wright had sharper words in the press that, you know, this, this is who this guy is. Uh, so it's not a total surprise that he'd have this downfall. Well, I'd like to now invite Ed Bolin back in, a name that uh, may already sound familiar from something Julian said. And Ed, uh, go ahead with some of your very well-informed questions. And then audience members, you can put yours in the ask a question queue, and, and I'll look for those a little bit later in the hour. Yes. Uh, can you hear me okay? In here, bro. Ed, are you there with us? Yes. Can you uh, can you hear me? Barely, very slightly. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, let me go ahead with another question while we're getting Ed's technology set up. Um, who are, 
between Wright and Gingrich, yeah. what kind of access did you have to them in the course of your reporting and research? Did they agree to be interviewed? Did they share papers with you or were there papers that you had access to whether they were happy about that or not? So Jim Wright, he passed away. I, I did meet him. So uh, I had with him, his papers are in uh, Texas Christian University uh, where he taught political science. And he had pretty good papers, including a diary that he kept for much of his career, including in the early 80s that I use in the book where he's quite expressive about what he thinks of Newt Gingrich and the Red Hots, as he keeps calling them, <laughs> who are starting to come to power in Washington. And I also spent about, it must have been about three hours or so speaking with him. Um, mm -hmm. It's really quite interesting. Uh, with Gingrich, who I did meet years ago, I had lunch with him at Princeton before I was writing this book at, at a small lunch. I was not able to interview him. Uh, he kept rescheduling and uh, it, he was constantly busy. I don't know why, but it just never uh, came to pass. That said, he gave me access to his papers. And for the historian, as you know, that's really what I always right. use most and rely on most. And Gingrich's papers were really the most superb congressional papers I encountered. Uh, most congressional papers, many of them, especially House members, are filled with letters to constituents and back and forth and reprints of articles and speeches, which are all good. But what Gingrich kept were memos, private letters to other members of Congress, and an amazing window into how this all worked. And so uh, in the end, that became the heart of, of what I did. And then I interviewed many people, reporters. Well, of course. Uh, the special prosecutor who conducts the investigation against uh, Gingrich. So I did get some of that. But for me, the papers are the heart of this. Right. And I, uh, one last thing I see, Ed, is back. Um, you know, a treasure that a historian finds for readers out there is you're going through boxes and boxes of material and you're looking for stuff. And like one document I found, it was this little yellow pad, a, pa a piece of paper from a yellow pad that was basically tucked in between files by accident in some box. And I looked at it and I'm trying to read it and figure out what it is. This is in the Gingrich papers. And I quickly figure out this is the notepad where he was scribbling notes as Jim Wright stood and gave this one hour speech resigning uh, wow. Congress. And uh -huh. in real time, he was writing down moments when he was angry about what Wright was saying about him and his thoughts on the ethics process. And finally, I can't remember the exact wording that's in the book, but when he says it, basically, at least I know now that they're talking about me, you know, I'm doing something right. Well, you uh, found you found Rosebud. Yeah, right. <laughs> Find a treasure like that, and it's it's worth you know a million visits. It's just unbelievable. Okay, Ed, please jump in. Yes, I uh, apologize for that. And also, I want to remind people to um, if you're interested in the book, uh, there's a lot of great stories in it. So please click the button below. Um, first, though, I want to. I'm not sure if you heard, uh, if you know about an interesting postscript to the whole um, Camgate story. Is that when um, Tip came down to lay into Newt, he had to leave the speaker's chair, and he left it in the hands of Joe Moakley from South Boston, who was a friend of his, and um, it was Moakley who had to censor Tip and. Moakley said it was one of the scariest moments in his political career. He was literally shaking. Tip was furious at him because he didn't think he deserved it. And, uh, and I think Tip's quote was said, I could have said a lot worse. Um, <laughs> and he didn't speak to Joe Moakley for a week after he was censored uh, on that uh, shit. But uh, Joe Moakley said he was literally shaking when he had to uh, censor the, uh, the speaker for the first time. Um, so um, one question I want to ask those, uh, you know, uh, as um, as Sam mentioned, my father was uh, in, in the midst of this and those um, that generation, which was kind of too older, um, like Tip and my father and um, those folks, um, you know, they they operated from Tip's old maxim, like all politics is local. Um, 
And they really, you know, focused on constituent servicey over kind of a, any sort of broad ideas or a grand plans. I, and I, I, I don't get the sense at all that um, that Newt ever had much of an interest in his constituency or making sure, um, you know, his district was taken care of. Did, was there much of that or was he just always looking, you know, towards the bright lights? Well, let me the first story is a great one. And it, the, the Moakley uh, decision that he had to make is, is really important. But it also it just gets at the enormity of what Gingrich was doing, which today is since we're in the post Gingrich world, it's hard to understand uh, what it meant for a pretty unestablished member to go after uh, someone like the Speaker of the House and to even force the Speaker's own party to issue uh, decisions like that. This was really uh, aggressive in a way that's hard to convey and essential to understanding why a lot of Washington was taken aback uh, by what Gingrich does. The, the hard thing about writing about someone like Gingrich today is that because he was so successful, a lot of what he does has been normalized. And uh, to speak about, boy, the language Gingrich used was really out of bounds at the time. Today, it, it's hard for a reader to see that because it's the norm. And so it's the kind of, I think it's both the challenge of writing a book like this, but it's also exactly what I want to try to convey to see just how deeply rooted these changes are. And at the most uh, obvious level that President Trump didn't invent the party that has nurtured him. In terms of his district, I mean, he does bring money back to the district and uh, the kind of whole uh, Atlanta airport uh, area, um, you know, really develops and benefits from some of his largesse. He is certainly not a good government reformer and uh, he is fine helping out interest groups in, in the district and, and bringing back the kind of bacon that he goes after Jim Wright for doing. Um, so he's, he's not a new legislator. He's an old legislator, but he's never that attentive uh, to district work like some of the older members. He didn't care about committee work. He didn't really care about legislation. And he did what he had to do in the district, but this was not his passion. Jim Wright's the opposite. Jim Wright loved the district. Jim Wright's friendships were in his district. He rooted himself there. And if you talk to anyone from that area, they speak about Wright lovingly because of what he did for them and, and how he helped the area be strong. Whereas Gingrich, he's a national figure. And if he brought anything to them, it was to have this very powerful national Republican at the head of the party being their, their member. Uh, but that was enough to usually uh, get him a safe reelection. There's only one moment in 1990 where he's facing some trouble because a Democrat says, this guy isn't focused on the district at all, uh, just saying. Um, but I think that, yeah. that's how I see his relationship with it. The other thing I'm, I'm particularly curious about is, um, is my, um, my, my father and a number of his colleagues, um, they have, um, they have lifelong friends from their districts or like their chief of staff, like Leo Deal was Tip's chief of staff for kind of close 30 some odd years. My dad's chief of staff, 32 years, same people. Like they, they had these people who were dedicated with them, um, you know, throughout their careers and then friends to the day they died afterwards. Um, was there anyone, cause as I was reading this and thinking about what, uh, what I, you know, what I was exposed to um, and how different it was, what is, is anyone like that for Gingrich kind of a, you know, uh, uh, but, you know, behind the scenes person that's, that's been with him the whole time, you know, um, um, or is, has Gingrich just kind of gone from staff to staff to staff, whoever, you know, helps him at the moment? Yeah, not, I mean, not staff to staff. He's had people who've been with him. It changes. In the early 70s, he has more of an eclectic group that's supporting him. And then in 78, he starts getting national figures to help him, like a guy named Bob Weed, 
the Republicans basically, they see Gingrich as an up and comer and they send him uh, support. Uh, and and there have been staffers who've been with him. He doesn't have a go-to person uh, like it sounds like your father had. He's much more of a lone ranger in, in terms of, of his approach. He's extremely difficult. Uh, I even found mm -hmm. out where he's constantly apologizing to his staff for getting angry at them and yelling at them. Right. Uh, and he'll blame it on different things, being tired, trying to lose weight, uh, stories like that. Yes. Um, but that kind of relationship, I think, is not something uh, that's as clear with him. He had close relations with some members, I'd say more than staffers, like Bob Walker. Uh, oh, that guy. Pennsylvania. <laughs> Same reaction, man. He was one of the, the cam scam speakers and... Uh, he elicits that re exact reaction, and and that's the cohort I think he felt the thing. I I can I can still hear his voice from those puffy. He, 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 oh God. Um, um, okay, I, I have one last question, yep. um, and then I'll uh, hand it over back to Sam. But um, you know, you you point out in the book that um, um, throughout his rise in um, in um, Congress, Gingrich's. Um, very vocally anti-communist, anti-Russian. Uh -huh. How does he feel about Russia today? That's a good question. I mean, in terms of how you would interpret that through the administration, he has no problem with the president's relationship with Russia and Putin. He was very hawkish his whole career. Uh, he remained part of the hawkish Republican coalition that until President Trump uh, became president was pretty pronounced in the Republican Party. It wasn't really a wedge issue in the party, but he's not been very critical at all of the president. He has been one of his strongest defenders throughout the investigations involving Russia. I don't know personally how he feels, but in terms of what you can measure, he's one of the president's most steadfast supporters. And you can look at his appearances on Fox, his Twitter feed, Everything the president does, he is one of the first people to explain why it's great. Uh, from the Mount Rushmore speech to his strategic approach to Russia and North Korea to the Fox interview with Chris Wallace, uh, which he was one of the only people who somehow found a way to say that was actually a wonderful interview. Uh, so, you know, again, but, but Gingrich is someone, he it was a hawk and he was uh, an anti-Soviet person but he's also very malleable in terms of his policy positions. Again, ultimately what concerns him is the power of the GOP rather than any particular principle. All right, I'll take it back uh, from Ed and I'm gonna go down to our question screen here and see what we've got. Um, well, that, the question is the one that Ed put in about whether Gingrich did anything. <laughs> For his uh, constituents. We have an answer to that. Folks, anyone else who wants to put in a question, go ahead. So, but let me pick up from there. You know, Julian, you're a historian of Congress. Um, today was a day when much of the nation was watching the funeral for another member of Congress from Georgia, John Lewis. And of course, the tributes to him in the morning for him has occupied much of the last week. Two things. One, what, if anything, do you know about what kind of relationship these two members of Congress from the same state had since Gingrich and Lewis would have been in office together for probably the entirety of Gingrich's tenure in the House? Um, and secondly, laying Gingrich aside for a moment, your own thoughts about John Lewis and, and his legacy and uh, today's you know, day of, of eulogies and and tributes at Ebenezer Baptist? I, the first question is a good one. I don't know the answer in terms of their personal the relationship. And Lewis had fought um, the personally. I mean, I can say I've spoken to many members and very few have warm feelings about Gingrich. And I can't, I can't uh, overstate that. Uh, not that they just don't like him very much, but many Democrats of the Lewis uh, generation and before have 
visceral feelings, um, like Ed's dad. They, they have these visceral feelings about what Gingrich did, the way he did it, and what he did to this institution. And uh, I don't know if Lewis somehow got beyond that because of who he was, but it's hard to imagine he didn't share this. I, I haven't found anyone who isn't uh, remembering or thinking of Gingrich in, in this way. And in terms of obviously policy, what he was supporting was usually antithetical to what Lewis spent most of his career doing. Lewis himself is just a fascinating figure. I think is a, a he is a, an American hero. Uh, studying him uh, during the civil rights era for a book I wrote a couple books ago. Uh, really remarkable the role he played in, in being one of the grassroots activists who just changed how Washington thought about voting rights and and how urgent it was to pass legislation, literally giving his body uh, to the cause. And he is an interesting contrast as a member of the House with Gingrich because he's not someone who's associated with a huge amount of legislation, uh, but what he was, and he's often called this moral conscience of the uh, Democratic Party. And he's really interesting in that he, at some level, argued that the party needed core principle, if it was going to be robust, if it was going to be successful. And Gingrich is different. He's not about, he's almost the opposite. It doesn't need to have principle. It needs to focus on the win. And it's a stark contrast in uh, how you go about politics. But but I think Lewis is a really uh, remarkable, he is a living, he was a living embodiment of social justice in the political process being expressed through elected government. All right, we now have another question in the uh, queue. So let me read it to you, Julian. Wasn't Gingrich also known for changing the relationships of representatives by insisting that the rep returns home on the weekend, which changed the Democrats and Republicans from interacting with each other? He was part of that shift. I wouldn't say he does that entirely on his own. There's many factors, including the ease of air travel, which uh, cheaper airplanes, which you know, start to push members to go back. But yes, I mean, in the '90s, when he huh? in the house, he is uh, a leader who is encouraging people to get away from Washington uh, and to spend, you know, less time certainly in the old rooms of negotiation. Uh, um, but I wouldn't say that's because of him. So, there's other steps he takes that are probably more uh, his direct responsibility. Okay. You know, one of the things that comes out both in your book and in one of your earlier answers is Gingrich's ability to live in contradictory dialectic tension with himself. Yeah. In this respect, yeah, he portrays himself as a foe of corruption, as someone who's not partisan, but who's opposed to the swamp although I don't think that term is being used yet, wherever he finds it. And yet you were talking before briefly about his cozy relationships with big donors. So who were the big donors who over the period of his career he was close to and what was it that he did for them and, and what is it that they got from him? Well, here's an example. Uh, during my story, he is uh, in 1989, going after Speaker Wright and, and the other scandal beyond the relationship with a real estate developer is a story that Jim Wright sold this book uh, that he published of speeches and kind of short writing. He would sell it in bulk uh, to interest groups, to large associations when he spoke to them. And he did it because if you were a member of the House, you could earn a certain amount of money in speaking fees, and you couldn't go above that. But book royalties weren't covered by the ethics rules. So he and other members would sell books as a way uh, where they supplemented their income. And Gingrich argued this was corrupt. It was trying to violate the rules uh, that the House put into place. As this is breaking, literally, within a couple months of the speaker finally resigning, an investigation comes out that he is receiving money, Newt Gingrich, or he had a book deal where he had published a book and received uh, 
uh, money from various interest groups in the Atlanta area that gave him money to promote his book uh, and to buy ads. And uh, some of them were associated with the Atlanta airport uh, and the construction that surrounded all of that. Uh, and that's the exact, that's kind of an embodiment of what you're talking about. The difference is he had a press conference and he just said, this is irrelevant. Uh, it's not a scandal. My book was legitimate. Jim Wright's was not. And right. Jim Wright responded to the scandal by offering long technical explanations of why it didn't violate any rules. It captured the difference with the parties in a nutshell. But I'm curious also, was Gingrich um, involved with the Koch brothers network or Art Pope uh, or the Mercers or some of the other, you know, big as Jane Miracles and dark money donors, or was he even part of trying to recruit um, people from, you know, the far right, the very moneyed far right, who maybe hadn't been big political donors previously and bring them into being big donors. Well, sure. Even early in his career, he's working with, um, and he's part of a Republican cohort that's working with donors in the 70s and 80s, um, like uh, the Scaife family or the Coors, who were pouring a lot of money into the Republican revolution of that period. And then as speaker, in the 90s, he and people like Tom DeLay are developing what's called the K Street Connection, where they're really refining um, some of the relationships. The, the Koch brothers are coming in into their own in the 1980s. And yes, I mean, that's when the Republicans are forging this very close relationship. Um, so at both stages, he's at the heart of this alliance between Republican slash conservative donors and the congressional wing of the party. And, and another way in which he's this living contradiction and successfully um, pulls it off, it seems, is as you were saying, he's been an ally of the religious right. Um, his own um, marital life could be described, uh, this is a clinical term, as a dumpster fire. <laughs> um, and yet in recent years, he converts to Roman Catholicism and his wife, Callista, becomes President Trump's ambassador to the Vatican. Yes. So is any part of that conversion for him legit, or is this just further um, expediency? And well, also, in a way, is he, because he had these multiple marriages, affairs, as you said, delivering a demand for divorce to his first wife when she's in a hospital bed uh, dying of cancer, and yet he holds on to votes from the religious right. In that way, does he anticipate Donald Trump? So two different questions. Yes. In terms of now, I can't speak to his personal feelings, and I, I don't know his personal life right now. So I'll take him at face value, I am sure, just after studying his career, he believes this conversion is legitimate. I mean, he believes what he says at some level, even when it's totally at odds uh, with the reality of his life. And so uh, I'm sure he could come on right now and offer a very convincing claim as to how he has changed. Of course, he's supporting President Trump very adamantly, who himself defies a lot of these principles. So. Just there, we see a real question of how serious his commitment is. Uh, and does he anticipate President Trump? Yes. I mean, he was living a life in the 80s and 90s at odds with a key part of the Republican coalition. He never disassociated himself with that coalition. And he argued he was very sympathetic. But his personal life was, it was a mess. And it was known in Washington. And, and never did he try to reform his ways very seriously. Uh, so in that way, he is a little bit like Donald Trump. I would say the difference is he still believed Gingrich. He was part of this Republican revolution. I do think he was power hungry. He was a power broker, but there was a cause he was fighting for, in his mind at least, this shift of American politics that took place. I don't think President Trump believes he's part of that. Uh, he is much more a lone wolf. And I think 
He depends on the Republican Party, but he doesn't care about them at all. Right. And He's not a party builder. Difference with the two. But personally, there's a total connection in the difference between what they're saying or what their allies are saying and the way they live. Okay. Another question has popped up. I have a couple more of my own, but I'll give our guests the uh, opportunity. Wasn't Gingrich, oh, wait, that's the uh, previous one. Do you think there is a way back from the hyper partisanship? Gingrich unleashed in the House? I think it's it's hard. Uh, I mean, one thing my book, just to be clear, is arguing is I think the changes are more dramatic in the Republican Party than in the Democratic Party. The Republicans as a whole moved more to the right, the Democrats as a whole did to the left. And I do think the Republicans in general, the leadership, have been much more aggressive in how they see legitimate partisan politics. And so it's not just polarization. The real question in my mind is what will it take for the Republican party to change at this point right. from where it is. And I think it's difficult. Look, the story of my book is this is decades in the making and Donald Trump isn't an aberration. Donald Trump's very much a product, a logical product of what's happened to the party. So how does that change? Doesn't change if Donald Trump loses the election. I think it will take uh, a series of major disastrous election defeats, meaning a presidential defeat of great magnitude, a series of congressional election defeats to basically make Republicans rethink what they're doing, to shrink the size of the party so it doesn't have as much power. It's only through really devastating loss that a party will rethink itself when it's this dug in. And we have to remember it now has a, a conservative media ecosystem, which will continue to say what they're doing is right, even if there are losses. So it's gonna take really big losses for the party to change. I'm not optimistic of anything in the short term. Okay. We're running low on time. So two quick things. One, I wanna remind everyone again, you can click on screen on the green bar to buy this wonderful book by Julian Zelzer and uh, contribute to the good fortunes of Books and Books, that fantastic store. And so Julian, this is pretty much beyond the frame of this book, but again, as someone who watches Congress closely as a scholar of Congress, I've always been fascinated by the relationship between Gingrich and Bill Clinton. And that may be you know, another book for you or for someone else. And for much of it, predictably, they're deeply at odds. Gingrich shuts down the government um, in early 95 to try to have leverage over Clinton. Gingrich is furious with Clinton when he is not, I think, up in the front of Air Force One on a plane to Yitzhak Rabin's funeral in Israel. Gingrich, of course, is a big advocate of the impeachment of Clinton. And yet, and yet, and yet, there are these points where they seem to have been able to do some legislating together. Um, am I misremembering that or somewhere within Gingrich's, you know, combative blood sport, um, you know, core of his being, was there an ability to do a deal when it needed to be done? Yeah, so there, there is a book on that by a historian named Steve Gillen. Oh, okay. Act. And, you know, to Gingrich after 1995 and 96 is able to reach some areas of agreement with Bill Clinton, but President Clinton is conceding to what the Republican Congress wants. So the biggest deal that actually happens is welfare reform, which is it's pretty antithetical to where a lot of Democrats are. It's very punitive legislation. Many Democrats are not happy with getting rid of this commitment from the New Deal. And so, yes, Gingrich is willing to take a deal, but that was a deal on his own terms. Uh, right, so it's really the, market, the government ends up closing twice uh, because they won't reach a deal until again, uh, you know, there's a pretty significant concession. Even though Gingrich looks bad, uh, Clinton moves to the right. And mm -hmm. uh, Steve Gillen's story is interesting in that it's all this book is about a deal that's being negotiated in 1997 and 98 for huge entitlement reforms, basically cuts in Social Security and Medicare, uh, 
uh, in exchange for some provisions that Clinton wants. But the deal never happens. It's a mm -hmm. book about a deal that doesn't happen because the impeachment ultimately overwhelms it. The key is that impeachment grows out of the politics that Gingrich had practiced. So uh, negotiating a deal is different than putting all your eggs in that basket. And ultimately, it's that impeachment, which I think is much more characteristic of what the Gingrich Congress was about. Okay. I'm seeing Ed on our screen. So unfortunately, I'm thinking that means we're running uh, the sand through the hourglass. I think so. So um, really? shall I uh, close this out, Ed, or is that you, for you to do? Okay. Well, I want to thank Ed Boland, thank all the great people at Books and Books, led by the extraordinary Mitch Kaplan, um, and thank Julian Zelzer, who's been a great friend and scholar and writer. I read all the time, see on TV regularly, um, and just admire in both personal and professional ways immensely. This is a fantastic book, whether you're a follower of congressional politics or not. Um, lucidly written, a real page turner, an incredible character study of two antagonists who are cut from extremely different cloth. And um, so I just thank Julian for sharing some of his insight and wisdom with us. And uh, we wish all of you out there well. And again, we hope that you'll buy lots and lots of copies of this book. Thank you and good night. Thank you, everyone.